Welcome everyone to HGSC's leadership series. We'll get started in just a minute. Welcome again to the HGSE Leadership Series. We're gonna start in just a minute. I can see we have the number of participants growing. Uh, wanna make sure that everyone who is able uh, has time to join us. So just wait a few more minutes. We'll wait just a few more minutes and are anxious to get started. So welcome. Welcome everyone. We're gonna get started in just one more minute, but for those who need live captioning, you can use the CC button at the bottom of the screen. Also be sure to be uh, thinking about your questions that I can ask Paul um, as we conclude our own conversation. So I'll give it just 30 more seconds and we'll happily get started. Well, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bridget Terry Long, and I'm very proud to be the Dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I'm also oh pleased to welcome you to the first event of HGSE's Leadership Speaker Series. This series was developed in response to the unprecedented challenges that the education sector is facing as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are all well aware that the current events are having a profound impact on education. And over the course of this series, we will be joined by guests whose leadership, expertise, and vision are uniquely positioned to drive the sector forward. I am so thankful for the hard work of many who have um, brought this series forward. Um, I want to especially thank Jody Smith Bennett, Meg McDermott, and the whole Team Connect uh, group uh, for putting this together. For today's event, I am delighted that we are joined by Paul LeBlanc, president of Southern New Hampshire University. It's very fitting that Paul is our first speaker as he is well known for his influence in innovation in higher education, particularly as it relates to the shift to online learning. Since becoming president of SNHU in 2003, Paul has led the institution as it has grown from serving 2,800 students to over 135 thousand learners. Today, it is the largest nonprofit provider of online higher education in the country. Paul has been named one of the most influential people in higher education by Forbes magazine, and Washington Monthly named him one of America's 10 most innovative university presidents. I'm so grateful to Paul for joining us today. Paul has been a frequent contributor to the HDSE community. 
Uh, he's participated as a special speaker in a number of our courses and recently served as a member of the Harvard Graduate School of Education's visiting committee. So again, please join me in welcoming Paul, who's gonna share a few words uh, before we have a bit of a conversation. Uh, and then I look forward to um, asking him some of your questions that you submitted when you registered, or please do use the Q&A tool um, as part of Zoom so uh, we can uh, help get your questions to Paul. And so with that, um, welcome again, Paul. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Bridget. It's really a pleasure to, to be kicking off the series. I'm, I'm gonna be like the first pancake, you know, the one that's not quite as good as the others that follow, but you have to get <laughs> that one out of the way to get started. Um, so you've done a nice sort of over your snapshot of Southern Hampshire University. Uh, sometimes our name makes us makes people think they're public. We're not, we're actually private and that has some advantages. Um, we, I'd like to talk a little bit about how mission focused we are. Um, we often think of ourselves as serving underserved populations. If you take a look at those 135,000 learners, about 4,000 are on a campus and it's a bucolic, beautiful campus in Manchester, New Hampshire. But most of those students are, you know, 29, 30 year olds. 86% um, of them are working full time. Most of them have kids. 80% of them tried college before. They often have credits from more than one institution. Um, life got in the way, right? Any number of things, including they weren't ready the first time, but maybe kids happen, maybe job opportunities happen, maybe money ran out, any number of things. So they're coming back and they're trying to do this really hard thing, which is to try to you know, hold down a job, take care of their family, and now they're going to squeeze in a college education. It's so much harder than the traditional experience that I had as an undergraduate, um, oftentimes dealing with a lot of things that are stacked against them. So as you know, something like 50% of Americans say they would struggle to come up with $400 for an unexpected car repair or an unexpected medical expense. Those are our students. So their social capital is this thin, and it's really hard. Like, they're fragile learners, um, not because they lack capacity. They have amazing capacity if you think of what they're juggling compared to the typical student, but they just don't have a lot of resources drawn. So very proud of that work. We graduate, we're in the sort of low, excuse me, about the middle to high 40 percentile. Now this is a population, well, that's not that high, but remember for this population, it's not untypical to be in the single digits or low teens uh, we work in one community, one large city I won't mention, but the community colleges there have a 4% graduation rate. Um, so it, it sort of speaks to the challenges of this population. So we feel very proud of the work we do there. It extends from um, these online populations, 18% of them are military. So these are people who are actively serving or veterans, um, and, and, and they in some cases are deployed. So. I taught an online poetry class and I had an amazing young student, a woman who uh, was in Afghanistan at the time. And she said, this poetry is what keeps me sane. Um, uh, but we're also, we have the most ambitious program to bring full degree programs to refugees and displaced learners in the world. So we are in Lebanon and Kenya, the Kakuma camp, which is 200,000 people, the largest camp in the world, Malawi, South Africa, and Rwanda. But we also work on playgrounds in South Central LA with homeless kids and kids who have timed out of the foster care system. So we've tried to build an incredible, um, uh, flexible uh, set of programming that often is you know, fully online with partners um, deployed in many, many ways. So, so very mission driven. Um, that, that's sort of the heart of what we think about when, when we think about SNHU. And when people, you know, everyone says they're mission driven, I'll just, I'll finish with this Bridget, but I had the sort of somewhat cynical publisher of one of our trade publications uh, come to visit us. He wanted to get under the hood and see what we do. And, you know, we, we run our online operation on this huge mill complex in Manchester where they used to make shoes and textiles. And now it's just full of, you know, amazing young people who are thinking hard about all that goes into doing really high quality online education. I know we're going to talk about that. But I said to him, look, I'm not going to walk you around. Like, I'll give you the tour so you can see where things are, but go. Like, go by yourself. No PR people with you. Just talk to people. Talk to anyone you want randomly. And he came back about 90 minutes later. He goes, I don't know what you've given them, but they've drunk the Kool-Aid. Like, they are on the mission. And the mission is we'll run through walls for our students. And that's what it requires. That is amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Um, so I, I'm going to want to come back to that question and how you've built that culture. But uh, let me start off with a more general question. So when you first arrived, it was a residential campus and you've made investments and really grown uh, this online portfolio. 
I'm, I'm curious why you decided to go in that direction and you're certainly doing it before, I mean, pretty much anyone else. We, we ran early and you know, uh, we got in early because we were a preferred provider for the US Navy. So we were on naval bases. We were down in, in, um, in Puerto Rico and the uh, uh, Roosevelt Roads Naval Base and the Brunswick Naval Air Station here on the coast of Maine, not far from where I am today. And the Navy in 1995, very early, said to their preferred providers, if you want to con con continue to have this status, we realize that every time we put a sailor on a ship, he or she becomes a college dropout because they can't get to class the next day. So you need to do this new thing called distance education. And they really kind of dragged us into it. It was very fortuitous. When I came around in 2003, we had a nice little online operation, about 17 people. It's now thousands of people. Um, and, and they were doing really good work. And when you're a new president, I always say, and I've said this uh, actually at, at Hugsy uh, in classes with master's students, when you're a new president, it's like you're being dealt a hand of cards in a poker game. You gotta be really, like you have to be the biggest cheerleader externally, but you better be a hard nosed critic of what you have in your hand. Like you have to play your best card. And we were unknown, local, like we did a, one of the first things I did is I commissioned a marketing study in New England and only 8% of people in Boston, which was like an hour away, knew our name. So I thought, this is not good. Um, and we had a very traditional campus, which sort of dominated, but, but I knew what online was doing. And I could see that when online, when fully virtual online became possible because there had been a rule by the federal, by the Department of Ed that had, was called the 50% rule. So 50% of your education had to happen on the ground. When they lifted that rule, it made a fully virtual degree possible. Not-for-profit education looked down its nose at online, which was honestly not as good as it is today, um, and kind of said, not us, like that's, that's subpar. And the for-profits rushed into the space. And at the height, they had 12% of America's college students. Yes. Now they've been in steep decline. But I looked at that and thought, we can do this well. Like we, we've been doing it for a long for a number of years now. We got the nucleus of this. And I don't think I can take my traditional campus, which is not so well regarded, even though there was good work happening there, it wasn't known. I'm not, I'm not gonna be a Babson or Bentley, but I bet you I could build a really successful operation to extend our mission to adults. And that's where we started back in 1932 with adults. I can extend our mission. And I think I can go head to head with the four profits. I think we can do this with learning what they do well. And even though they're much maligned, sometimes deservedly so, they do some things well, and then keeping our values and our mission at the forefront and see if we can do that. So in 2012, Babson does an annual survey of not-for-profit not providers of higher ed. In 2012, we were number 50 on their list of 50. And three years later in 2015, we were number four. And two years later, we were number one or two, depending on how you count, us and WGU. So, so that's kind of how we came to it, which was there's an opportunity, there was a huge need, right? There are 37 million Americans with some credits and no degrees. And you know what they're not doing? They're not going to our campuses, right? They have busy lives. You know, for them to go to campus means work all day, eat a fast food dinner in the parking lot, go to class, and maybe if you're lucky, you'll get home in time to see your kids before they're asleep. And when online comes along, it's driven by convenience. It's this idea that I can work all day, go home, have dinner with my family, do homework with my kids, make dinner, you know, can I put the dishes in the dishwasher. And at nine o'clock, when I put my fuzzy slippers on to make a cup of tea, now I'm a college student for the next two to three hours. There's no comparison. And that it was really convenience that drove people to online learning. And then we just got better and better and better at it. Right. Yeah, so as the technology approved, improved, then it gave us more options and flexibility in thinking about delivery. Um, but we're going to spend a lot of time talking about online. And, and I think right now, you know, we've just seen all of these institutions, including our own, have to switch to remote learning in the matter of a week. But what you're talking about is actually something different. So I, I wonder, you know, how does it compare? What would, how do you, could you talk a bit about the, the quality of what an online course, one that's designed to be online rather than one that just flips to being remotely taught. Um, kind of what are some of the advantages of that, you know, even in yeah. comparison to face-to-face? -to -face? So I'm going to, I'm going to separate out an online education from the academic design, the pedagogical design from the supports, because these are two very different things. And I see and hear right now, enormous conversation about the academic side 
and ironically, not nearly enough about the supports when students need those even more than ever before. But we can come back to that. On the academic side, if you're familiar with Clay Christensen, who was a longtime friend, we just lost him this year, and he was a member of my board for nine years. Clay's original sort of famous graph is that when a new disruptive innovation comes in, it starts actually well below the incumbent technology or service or product, but it gets better at a much deeper curve. So I would say 10 and 15 years ago, we were below sort of traditional face-to-face. -face. And then sometime, not long ago, we actually got as good, the best designed online goes good. And I would argue that our quality assurance measures in online are much more robust than they are in a traditionally delivered program. How so? So first of all, if you take a look at how courses come together, an online course for us is a standardized course. And that sort of chafes against many academics. But reality is we, you know, if you have a thousand sections of intro to psych, you need to make sure that they're all really good. And to do that, we're gonna to bring together subject matter expert, instructional designer, assessment expert, content expert, and we're gonna have that team design that course. And then we're gonna kind of have conversations and why don't you say what's different? So if I just try to take my traditional course and put it online, there may be materials that I use in a classroom that actually don't work as well as other sorts of things that are available to me in a digital format. So our content expert is gonna be looking at that going, hey, Professor so-and-so, I know you love this, but let me show you what you can do with this. Now, all of a sudden, you get this sort of wonderful interplay between the sort of designers of this course. And the assessment expert, and I would argue that assessment is such a weak spot in higher ed generally. Yes. The assessment yes. expert is saying, I think we can do something much more robust and that will work for these students in a way that, um, that assure, reassures us that they're actually learning what they should learn. Then we put this in a reasonably robust learning management system. I think they're all kind of works in progress, but, but we sort of build that in. But then we have tools. We have 75 people on our data analytics team, including a team in Chennai, and they're building tools. We monitor every student and every section and every faculty member 24 seven. So we do predictive analytics on incoming students. We have a sense of how they're gonna perform and what level of support they'll need. We're looking at how often they're in the course. We're looking at the nature of their engagement in the course. We're looking at how often instructors are in the course, how are they responding? And then every single week, we have a master faculty member go in and take a look. So we do the sort of quantitative algorithmic analysis that's producing updated da dashboards every day. And then we go looking and we have someone going in and we're having someone taking a look. And if you're a really experienced teacher in that environment, you can tell within five minutes if good things are happening. I'm not a K-12 person, but I once had a really experienced mentor say to me, I can walk into a public school and tell you in 15 minutes if this is a healthy culture. And I think there's something like that in the online course. Now look at there's tons of nuance below that surface, but you guys don't know, like robust discussion, students' questions are being answered. The faculty member isn't standing there as expert. He's actually, or she is orchestrating the conversation. You know, when you're in an online environment, you have to be a conductor, not, not an expert. Um, so, so all of that's happening. All of that's undergirded with a very powerful um, CRM, a customer relationship management pack, uh, platform. So all of the, what's happening academically is being fed to advisors who are in many ways almost like life coaches. So yes, they're doing academic advising, but for our students, really, it's much more emotional and psychological. It's all the baggage of Oh my God, I haven't been in school for 10 years. I just wrote my first paper. I got a D. I knew I wasn't college material. C, mm. I knew I shouldn't be here. And we often, our advisors are often aware of their students' performance before their students are fully aware. So it's a very proactive outreach model. Um, and a lot of this is about pace. We know, we have a neuroscientist who study this and like when our adult students fall off pace, boy, their risk just goes through the roof. So. Bridget, you haven't logged on in three days. What's going on? Mm. And if Bridget says, oh, God, my kid's been sick. Work's driving me crazy. No, I, I, like, I, I'm taking Saturday. I'm going to catch up. Like, she's good. She's, she's like, she's got grit. She's going. If Bridget's response is, I don't think I can do this. That's a critical moment. Like, that's a critical moment of intervention. So all of that, and now compare that to what I get to see on a traditional campus where the faculty member closes the door on day one, I don't get to see inside again. Maybe the midterm grades will give me something or if there's a complaint. Maybe once a year, there's a dean or an assistant dean sitting in to observe, which is kind of performance art. And then I may get a student evaluation after the semester ends. 
there was no comparison. Now look, we don't ask our traditional faculty to do what we do in online, right? There's a trust here and we hire really great professionals as Harvard does. We say, nope, you're really good at your job and we trust you to do those things. But when you're doing 135,000 students and you're doing it remotely and you're doing it with this population, you need this kind of robust quality assurance. Sorry, that's a long answer, but there's so much that goes into doing this well, which makes me like, I cringe a little bit when I hear people say, God, I'm doing online now and it's really awful. I think you're not doing online, you're doing emergency remote and that's okay, you should. Right, right. Different animal, as you said earlier. Right, so these are definitely different things and there's, there's so much to unpack with what you just said. One of them being this constant theme of people and just how important people are in the process, even with the technology. But at the same time, many of us, uh, you know, don't have 15 years to catch up with you and all the lessons that you've yeah. learned. So what advice do, would you have um, for the many institutions that are in this process of the emergency jumping to remote? And it's not just higher education. Like you said, it's also K through 12. Yeah. So I would say that in this immediate period, um, and everyone who's flown across country with a toddler knows this. You kind of relax your standards a little bit, make sure everyone arrives intact, do as little damage as possible and be compassionate, right? So, <laughs> so if a little bit of candy you'd never think of giving your kid is the thing that keeps them so from crying on the airplane, you give them a little bit of candy. So I think, you know, be a little patient, relax. Like this is less about having the most exacting academic standards. I know that's anathema to say in higher ed, but this is really about taking good care of people who are absolutely traumatized. So we took the generation of learners with the highest levels, record levels of anxiety, depression, and everything else that they're carrying with them. And we just added pandemic and massive recession. Things aren't going real well. And then we put them back under their parents' roofs, right? So right now, I think this is about compassion, getting them across the coast on that airplane, do as little damage as possible and see if we can pick up the pieces once we land. Um, so you're just getting through. But then I think if you look ahead, and by the way, when I say relaxed standards, it's actually, I would almost flip this and say, it's not so much about relaxing your academic standards, it's really dialing up your standards of care and compassion. Like what we've been saying to our faculty is, your first question with a student when you're getting on is not how are you doing with your work, it's how are you doing? How's your family doing? Are you okay? Um, my wife teaches occasional courses and she's teaching a law course right now for us, undergraduate law course. And she's a woman who just lost a family member and she's a, and she's a single mom and, and she lost her brother and now she's got her brother's kid and she's trying to get through these last weeks. I said, you've been an A student, don't worry about it. Yeah. So this is all over coffee. We'll have coffee. We'll talk about the things that we didn't quite cover. You're good. And this woman wrote back and said, this is the first time I've smiled in weeks. Right? And look at, did she not, did she miss a little bit of the coverage in the course? Yeah, probably. Does it matter? No, it really doesn't. We'll figure that out. Um, so that would be my first, like, so toddler on the airplane level of like, we know what this is about. Start with, you now dial up your standards of care and compassion. And then the third, and this is the hard one, is you better start thinking about September. I'm in the camp that says we're not opening. Um, for us, for I think for us to open, look, I'm not an expert, is you have to have really widespread testing and you have to have tracking and monitoring. And we don't have anything close to that right now. So unless something miraculous happens this summer, I think our campuses are likely to be closed. I could be wrong, I hope I'm wrong. But if they're not, now you're talking about a different ball game. Um, right. And I think, how you get there is complicated because every institution is different. The resources are different. Here's what we know. You're really going, you're going to be okay on your academics. Your faculty have very high standards of what they want to do with students and how they're going to produce. So doing really a good job under the circumstances by and large, but you're going to really have to think differently about all the supports that have to be in place. So when people say, what's the secret of SNHU, you know, in our success, I would say it's actually our advising coaching models. They're, you know, and I described them to you earlier. The most powerful moments at graduation every May is when an adult learner comes to New Hampshire for the first time in their whole experience and meets their advisor. These people have been together. You know, think about how isolating it is for a high school student, an undergraduate of a traditional age or a learner, when everyone's in the other room watching their favorite TV show and you hear the laughter and you can smell the popcorn and you get to be in this room doing a paper. It feels pretty isolated. It's yeah. that advisor who's checking on you and going, Bridget, how you doing? Like, is everything going okay? And it's the text messages, you know, however you want to communicate with them. 
those are really powerful. And schools are going to have to figure out how to ramp that up. And interestingly, it's not a particular strength of higher ed. It's a pretty good strength of student affairs staff, right? They kind of live for this. But you have to be, you have to be thoughtful about this in a much bigger way. So, so that's one. Two, you have right now in your campus, on our campuses, people who really are playing with all the things that need to get addressed. Um, and they're often not in the higher upper echelons of the organization. So the folks who are saying, like, we're going to make this change in September, often don't know who the best people are in their own organizations in terms of this work. And we, you know, we're fond of saying, you know, the people closest to the problem are often closest to the solution. So there's a faculty member who's doing a lot of really cool stuff. And they're not talking about it because actually it doesn't get you tenure and it doesn't get your promotion. They just love it. And they love what happens with students when they do it. There's somebody in the library staff who's figuring this out. Like, how do you push down into the organization? How do you pull on all of those resources? Um, it's easy to think that in this crisis, we have to be very top-down driven. And that's kind of a myth, right? So if you look at, I don't know, stop. But if you look at, this is the analogy I would use. If you look at firefighting, we have this notion that the chief shows up and directs, right? But in reality, it's the firefighters who are closest to the fire, who are given latitude for how they proceed. And the chief is basically here getting their call saying, I need X, I need Y, I'm moving here, I'm moving there. The decision-making gets moved down because that's where you get it. So if you think about that in higher ed, we're so hierarchical and we're so siloed, we don't do that very easily. So there's a lot to think about. And look at, you can always turn to outside parties. They're eager for your business. So that's the OPM world. There are vendors out there. Uh, and what I hope will happen is that we'll see greater cooperation between institutions. Yes. Right. And we've been getting those calls, right? And we've been putting yeah. all of well, our training sure. materials we now make available through ACE for free. Like, just take it. Yes. Yeah. So again, the, the, the importance of, of people in this process for students, but also in thinking about teams, you're, you're, everything you're saying makes me feel so incredibly blessed to be at HGSE, to be at Hugsy with um, lots of smart people dedicated to working together. Um, but how do you foster the culture that's needed? Um, because if we take this even to K through 12, and as I'm, you know, been working with a number of different K through 12 school districts, there's a lot of variation in how well they've been able to respond to this that oftentimes goes to issues of culture, coordination, teamwork, because trying to do this all by yourself um, just doesn't seem to work. So, so how did how did you move uh, SNHU forward, or, or what advice do you have, what you know, as a leader um, for others who are trying to do this work? Boy, you know, and it's it's culture is like if your culture isn't in a good place now, here's the problem: it's really hard and slow to change culture. Yes. <laughs> so I think culture actually is it's this both sort of top down, ground up. So. If you can talk a good game on culture, but if people are looking at you as a leader and you're not walking that walk, right? If you say this yeah. is what's important, but all your reward structures are over here, you're like, I know what this is. There, you know, so you got to get those things aligned. Um, what you shine a light on is really critical. So people, you know, people, especially in a crisis, they take their cues, right? So what are yeah. we talking about? What's important from the ground up? Um, how you empower people is really critical. So I use that one example where very influenced by Stanley McChrystal's book, Team of Teams, I'm sure you know it, but he mm -hmm. talked about how the military in Iraq and Afghanistan had to move away from their top-down culture because things are too volatile, like the traditional battle plan wasn't holding up and all hell's breaking right. loose on the right. ground. So they moved to this idea of commander's intent, which is I can articulate for you with clarity what the goal is, but I'm not going to give you any certainty about how you should get there. What I'm going to give you instead is empowerment and tools and resources. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's not always easy in our academic institutions or even in our K-12 institutions, right? Where, again, hierarchy and silos really get in the way. And I think the problem with hierarchy and silo, particularly in this situation where things are so uncertain and moving very quickly, yeah. is that their rigidity becomes a kind of brittleness, right? And brittle breaks hard. So you, 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 it really starts with leadership thinking about 
how am I building this organization for how we want to move? And, you know, interestingly, we thought we were pretty good at this. And then we did some work and we brought in some outside expertise from places like the Center for Creative Leadership. We weren't as good at it as we thought. And I am so grateful that about three years ago, we really started to work in a very concerted way at how do we move away from our command and control mentality. We talked a good game of empowerment, we were command and control. And there was way too much, what does Paul want? Which is like, you know, nice for the ego, but not great for the organization. And I had to learn, that was me. Like I was screwing this up. It starts at the top, like I've got to change my practices as a leader and my people have to change their practices as leaders. And then we have to start talking about how we bring people up as leaders. So it's a work in progress. Um, I'm sorry if I'm being too abstract in terms of, you know, you're very pragmatic, like how do we change culture? Ground it in your mission and then walk the walk. I mean, those are the two things, ground in your mission and then walk the walk. Right. And really about authenticity. Yeah, and you're also describing a different kind of teaming and mindset for organizations. And given how quickly all of this is moving, you know, very, it, it, in order to be able to pivot and prepare for all the uncertainty and what might be possible this fall, you know, leaders are gonna have to have teams and be able to trust their teams because there's no way uh, you can be in all places at all times as you're trying to update your, your assumptions. Um, yeah, you can't do it, right? It's really, you said it, you can't be at all places at all times. You can't do it, you'll fail. Yeah, yeah, things are moving too quickly, too many needs. But I wanna pivot um, uh, just a, a bit. You've touched on this a, a little bit, but uh, you know, when I think back, you know, as a faculty member who's been teaching on these issues for uh, at least a couple of decades, I remember the initial um, expansion of online education and people really touting it as being able to increase access and anyone anywhere can now study. Um, and, but for the most part, that's not what happened. Um, and now we see, I know it's a different situation, but now we see as people particularly uh, K through 12, but even in our colleges and universities as, as they've had to move to remote, it's really underscored the inequities that students have in their homes and their neighborhoods, whether that's whether they have a computer, or how they can use the computer and, and so forth. So can you help me kind of understand and grapple with how can or when can, under what conditions, online education can actually address some of the inequities versus exacerbating them? Yeah. And you're right. I mean, I think the pandemic on so many levels within our society is shining a very harsh light on the inequities and privilege that sort of at work every day. And we know that, but wow, is it sort of right in, it's kind of a slap in the face right now. So for, for lots of students, there's a sort of essential one, right? Which is, it's sort of like asking people to make a cross country trip, but you can't have any access to paved roads. Like you gotta have, you gotta have access. You gotta have a computer, you gotta have broad, you gotta have, you know, broadband of some kind. Um, and, and, and that's one piece. And, you know, we have seen institutions sending out um, hotspots to students and, you know, we've been trying to order more of them. They're hard to get a hold of. Um, there are schools that are literally stringing routers across parking lots so students can pull in with their cars and get a Wi-Fi signal in the parking lot, but be safely distant. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so that's a critical piece. Um, I think that the flip of that is if we could get that basic infrastructure. So it'll be interesting to think about post pandemic, what becomes a right? Like, are we gonna think about healthcare differently after this disaster? Are we gonna think about access to technology differently after what we've seen kids go through? On the other hand, if I use the analogy of food deserts, um, now you have access to high quality academics even when they're not geographically close. This, this has been said about telemedicine. One of the things we're learning about telemedicine is that in communities where there's access to very, uh, no access or poor access to healthcare, telemedicine is just getting this huge boost. Um, and, and you could argue that's possible here, um, but that, that's, that's sort of the next level, right? That's that whole access piece. Um, to the extent that online can be more affordable, you get at one issue of access. It's not the same as equity, but if you don't, if people can't afford it, that's table stakes. Like they're not in the game at that point if they can't afford it. So we keep our cost of our programs low. You could do a whole undergraduate degree for 40,000 if you started at, at zero uh, at the starting line. I think there, um, what's not getting addressed in online and it's not endemic to online versus traditional is that I don't know that we're being nearly as good as we need to be about addressing the kind of structural inequities, cultural inequities, poverty of aspiration 
that happens with, with so many learners. And I think in many instances, the best version of this work is a hybrid of online with very strong wraparound services. So in the communities of color where we work, uh, in the underserved communities where we work, in the refugee camps, what we have found to be the most effective model is when we can uh, take our programs, deliver those online, but surround those students with on the ground support services. Because when we think of online, we often think of it in juxtaposition of being in place. All, all, excuse me, all online learning is place bound. Right? Now that place can be a playground in South Central LA where we do work with these amazing teachers and advisors who work with these homeless kids and kids are timed out of foster care. It can be in a refugee camp with the amazing partners we have, but it's all place-based. And, and I think that hybrid, like stop thinking about the simple bifurcation of online and face-to-face -face classroom. There's so many permutations that can get at equity and we're learning what those are. The big one for me, and, it's a, and I've been thinking about this a lot recently, is time is the real enemy of those who have lack of resources. Like time is a huge enemy. So I sat with an amazing student who's in one of our competency-based programs. So this is a hybrid. This is our, we deliver a competency-based degree program in the wraparound services right in Boston at a, at a wonderful partner called Duet. This woman is a single mom. She has a kid with chronic respiratory illness. She's been in the local community colleges, good schools like, you know, uh, Barnfield Community College, a school that I admire. Um, and what she said to me is that every time my little girl gets sick, I start missing classes and I miss assignments. And yet again, I've either failed the class or I've withdrawn and I've used up some of my Pell Grant eligibility, right? right? And when we put her in a program that's not time-based, everything worked out. But she said to me, because our CV program is not tied to time, she said to me, when my little girl gets sick, I hit the pause button. And then for the next 10 days till she's better and back to school, I'm her mom, only her mom. And when she's back, I hit the play button and I get back to my, my, my work. And there's no penalty for hitting pause. That changes everything. Um, and I think for me, as I've been thinking about this, our most underserved populations have been served best by our CBE non-time-based programs. Those are online. But that removing that piece has been huge. Mm. Yeah. So there's just lots of ways, like, I mean, yeah. like yeah. all things, right? It's like, if you do yeah. it poorly, it's going to exacerbate inequity. Right. But it also gives us new tools to really sort of powerfully get at it if we design it well. Yeah. Part of this is relaxing our old assumptions that it has to be in this particular time or this particular format or that, you know, relaxing oh. that actually be more flexible. Yeah, and you've seen the research on this, right? So if you yes. take the classic bell curve and at the end of a 14 week semester, add two weeks, everybody, the, the curve moves way over, right? So why, unless it's, unless you are le learning something that will be performed in time constricted ways, why do we care so much about time? So it took you two more weeks to get to really master it. That's okay. Yeah. Someone whose 12 year old son just came in for a moment because he just couldn't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Balancing <It's critical>. hands <laughs> becomes a little difficult. Um, uh, so I, I do want to get to some of the questions that the yeah. audience members have, but before we, we do that, I, I think one question that's on people's mind and my own is, what do you think is going to happen after this big push and everything that's changed with the pandemic? Do you have a sense of what you think higher education is going to do? Are we going to have many more online courses or what would be your vision of what you would like to see happen? Um, yeah. And maybe that takes you to, to, to a couple of the slides that you shared with me before. Oh, sure. And we can do those uh, in a moment. Um, so we're seeing a lot of awful online experiences. I mean, if we were designing a huge national experiment to see how well online could work, it would look exactly unlike this. <laughs> we would not take thousands, millions of students who didn't want this, right? They wanted a residential campus coming of age experience with their academics. We said, nope, you can't have that, go home. And we took faculty who did not sign up for this. And we said, by the way, you have to do this and you have to do it overnight and very little preparation. And in many instances, not much support. So we're gonna have a kind of self-fulfilling experience for the haters or skeptics of online. We're gonna have students saying it's not so great, um, but we're also gonna, I think, maybe see students say, wait a minute, could I unbundle these things? Um, we've done an interesting pilot where this past year, 
we have a cohort of 22 students who we said, look at you do our CBE um, competency-based uh, education program, undergraduate degree, you get it for free because you're in a pilot. You don't have any classes, but you have robust academic advising. And you can do all this project-based learning around competencies, but you get to live on campus, be in, play sports, do all the things, all the coming of age experience. And, and, we, and you get all of that. And what they discovered was, and what we, we had an outside study on, on this, they're absolutely as engaged as their peers and they're learning as well or better than their peers in terms of their academic experience. And I do think we're gonna see students, and you see this right now, um, it's, you know, is it a trend? I don't know. We have a lot of students who are, you know, threatening lawsuits to get back tuition saying, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this. What did they not sign up for? And I think it's really important. It's which job to be done, again, I'm using a Clay Christensen concept and Bob Moesta, what job to be done were they paying for? And the reality is they pay for two jobs if they're a traditional residential student. They're paying for their academic experience that leads to meaningful work, but they're paying for this amazing campus experience, right? It's all of that coming of age. And if you go on most tours of campuses with undergrads, this many questions about the academics, this many questions about everything else. Where do I get to live? Do I like the look of these people around me? Will I feel at home here? When do I study abroad? Can I volunteer with animals? I want to play on your soccer team, but I may not be good enough. Do you have club soccer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I don't see any abated appetite for the campus residential experience for high schoolers. I think they're going to want to come rushing back as soon as we allow them to do so. But I do wonder, given the recession, if they can afford to do so. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I really worry about that. And we may see the great unbundling of the residential experience from the academic experience. I'm, I'm, I think that's one possibility. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, I think that, that, I mean, I think that's the critical piece. I, you know, the pandemic is one thing and we'll muddle our way through this and probably behind us this time next year, I sure as hell hope, but I, the recession, <laughs> I mean, if I think back to 2008, 2009, yes. and what happened to families and students, and that is dwarfed, right? That was 8 million people unemployed over two years. We're at 22 million people unemployed in two months. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't think we are, we're, we're so consumed with the pandemic. I don't think we've kind of grips what the economics of that looks like in the fall. So you will see a changed landscape. You'll see schools gone, I think. Yeah, um, absolutely. Right, mergers. Um, all kinds of things. And you're going to necessarily have to see new program models. And many of them will incorporate online. May not fully, may not fully shift, but incorporate online. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to look at? Yeah, why don't you do, why don't you do that? And then we've got some great questions here from the audience. Would you say want to go right to the questions or go to the slides? Up to you. Why don't you do the slides? Because I, I, I think actually it would be valuable for, for people okay. that may address some of the questions. So real quick, um, we, you know, for what it's worth, SNHU perspective, um, we really tend to think of most of higher ed, which was designed in kind of a industrial model, if you will, as much more university centered. It's really about putting through large numbers of people and getting them into the workforce. So when you think about the admissions process on the far left, it's the university as gatekeeper, right? You earn your way in and you come in on our terms. So yes, we compete for students, but once you're in, you're kind of in the way we want you to be. Um, we make sure that you're part of our community. And then we get you on a track and you go through your major, your gen eds, your prereqs, your electives, your major, right? And you get a degree and, and look at below the line, we're gonna spice that up with some things, right? We're gonna give you that coming of age experience that's suggested below the line. And we send you off into your career. And if we have a good sports program, you're gonna root for your team and you're part of a clan on Saturdays. And the advancement office hopes you'll write a check periodically. And that's kind of the end of our transaction. It's a very transactional relationship. You might come back for a graduate degree or not. Um, and if you go to the next slide, we think that the future is actually shifts a lot of these sort of key assumptions. It's a more busy slide, so forgive me. But now instead of the institution at the center, it's the learner. And at the top, rather than gatekeeper, we really think about the institution understanding the student in very rich ways that we don't spend much time on today. And that's the blue box over at about one o'clock. Not just the student in terms of their grit, their cognitive abilities, how they learn, their capabilities, but also their goals, because the student population of America is incredibly diverse and has very different goals and needs and capabilities, including what kind of financial resources they have, how much time they have. 
I've been, I've been arguing for our own team that we've got to move more emphatically. I just wrote a piece in Forbes about this to have micro credentials because we have a lot of people who need to get in the workforce and retool. They don't have the luxury of two years and a new associate's degree. Like they need two months or six months to get back in. And in this map, we would now wrap the educational experience or curate the experience around that student, making, uh, taking advantage of all the ways that people learn, which is the box at five o'clock. And you know, you know the research, Bridget, on high impact practices, the classroom's not it. Like yeah. if you ask students where the most impactful, you know, the knee buckling learning experiences, it's when they, you know, stepped on the, into, into Italy for the first time because they come from a small town in Maine and they've never traveled before. Are their family done the resources? And we know that our military students come to us with amazing learning under their belt. Like we would kill to be able to kind of give this learning Oh, sorry, terrible analogy for a military student. We would give a lot to give a, to give this kind of learning to our students. So over here on the right, like all the ways we think about how students learn. And in this model, if you're going to give, if you're going to recognize learning in all the places it happens, then the university has to become a much better translator of that. And we think it's through competencies, which is not just simply vocational. Competencies is simply saying, here are the things you can do with what you know. These are performance-based. So at seven o'clock, we have to be much better at performance-based assessment. And with that, we can then give it the appropriate credential. And we see a future where there'll be a much greater range of credentials. So at five o'clock, a greater range of providers. So higher ed does no, has no longer a monopoly on, on, how, on post-secondary ed. And if you will, um, at nine o'clock, um, a much greater range. So we still think traditional degrees and traditional providers, i.e. universities, will be critically important, the most important, but there'll be room for a lot of other ways to think about this. And in a world where work is changing fundamentally, almost every, every job is changing every three to five years, that idea that you would go to school at 18 for four years and that would serve is sort of hopelessly antiquated. So we imagine an ecosystem of learning in which people will dip in out all of their life, in and out of that ecosystem. And when we think about that, it has to be an ecosystem that recognizes that sometimes that learning is two hours. Like, I just need this thing I'm not good at in this moment. And it might be college level, by the way, um, or two days, or two weeks, or two months, or two years. And it's an associate's degree. And in that world, you can start to think about subscription models. It's not transactional. It's really a lifelong relationship, perhaps. Um, co-op okay. memberships, learning co-ops, et cetera. So okay. fundamentally, and I'll stop here. The traditional value out of a university was about um, the creation, curation, and delivery of knowledge. And that's what people paid for. And the delivery was often the form of the faculty. In this model, the value add of institutions is in the translation, the curation of learning, the translation of learning, and the credentialing. And, and it's a real shift in the value add, and that changes how you think about almost everything. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I'm looking at the questions and I'm actually going to com combine three of them into one. They're all related. Um, so the model that you just uh, described is very much, you know, meeting the student where they are as an individual and their individual goals. But what about the importance of peer to peer learning? What about the importance of community? And then what about the importance of students staying connected as alumni? Those are all about relationships with each other rather than relationships with the institution. Yeah, so I'm going to go back to, so I thought when you said peer-to-peer -peer learning and students being with each other, we were talking about the powerful ways that students learn from each other, and we've got some wonderful models for that. But that last question makes me think someone's saying, what about the campus and the importance of being in a community of learners? I'm going to go back to that jobs to be done notion. So the job to be done if I'm doing a coming of age really requires a kind of intentional community that is a campus. Like I would say, yeah, if you want coming of age, online is probably a very hard place to get it. My 30 year old with two kids and a dead end job, they've had all the coming of age they can handle. They know what their life's about. They're driven by a different job to be done, which is get me the credential that unlocks an opportunity so I can take better care of my family as quickly as possible. That's their job. That's not the job of an 18 year old coming on campus. We had a really interesting lesson in this. We were probably 20 years ago, one of the first schools to offer a three-year degree program, undergraduate degree program. It was a competency phase. So we didn't just squish it in. We kind of really rethought the curriculum. And we couldn't, we thought this is a no-brainer, right? For kids with limited resources, we just took 25% off the cost of an undergraduate degree. But we struggled to get more than 35, 40 kids into the program. I couldn't get like, why? It's like, wait a minute. 
These are high schoolers who for years now have been working for this dream of a college experience. Four years of fun and learning and parties and sports and travel. And we just said, you know that thing you wanted more than life itself? We're giving you 25% less. Like, no, thank you. That's not, what, that's not the job I want done. Now, look at, we both know that by the beginning of the senior year, many students like, hey, no, I actually had enough of that. Like, I'm ready to get in the workforce. I want some other models. But when we, when we shifted that program and started marketing as a three-year undergraduate degree and then a fourth year to work on your master's, the enrollment shot right up because we got the job to be done correct. So when I hear people say, what about community and this you know, community of learners and peers around you? That's a certain kind of model for a certain kind of student. And we can't think of higher ed monolithically. There are very many kinds of higher ed. Now for our adult- well, let, learners, Can I push back on that a little bit? Yeah, please. So one of the unique things about higher education for years, at least in a more idealized um, kind of method is that you do get to be together. It's one of the only times in your life you get to be together with other people who have very different backgrounds, very different perspectives. And in, in a society that is becoming even more diverse, and we're yeah. seeing problems because we aren't connecting with people who think differently than us, look differently than us. You know, higher education has an important role to play, um, regardless of age. And so how, how do we think again about peer-to-peer -peer learning and the important, not of coming of age, but we somehow have to figure out how to all live and work together. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So we know it works really well in traditional residential campuses, as you've you said. So I'm, I'm agreeing with you on that point. I think for our adults, and again, I'm gonna use our 30 year old, you actually get remarkable diversity in online classes because they're not geographically bound, they're not class right. bound. Well, they're somewhat class bound, right? People with more privilege are choosing other paths for many op quite often, but the remarkable diversity of students, it's actually one of the things we have to work really hard on managing because people don't always sort of navigate those differences really easily. And as you know, in online environments, it's some ways easier to be kind of a jerk, right? So how as a faculty member do you do you sort of manage the blow ups? And we were just, we, I don't know if you know Ibu Patel of the Interfaith Youth Center, but we're talking with him about creating a set of online micro credentials to help people become kind of, to have a credential that reflects their ability to navigate difference and diversity. Um, so he has a really interesting model if you're familiar with it. So equally important there, differently enabled, with a different population than the one I think you and I think about when we think about what happens on a campus where people are in much more formative years. Um, with adult learners, you sometimes, the wonderful aspect of adult learners is they bring so much richness um, to the learning. The downside is they bring so much embedded experience to the learning. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we have had faculty, you know, describe to me the blow up in a class when you got a couple of guys who served in Iraq, who's in a class with somebody who's a Muslim and something gets said that's awkward and, and not, not, not uh, aggressive, but certainly like, okay, pause button. Let's talk about this current piece of the conversation right now. And boy, you got to be really skilled to navigate those waters. Right, right. Right. Really, I think, I think it's really underscored whether you're face to face or online, you have to be deliberate and thoughtful um, about how you're going to foster those kinds of, of conversations that are so important. Um, quick question about screen fatigue. We're all feeling it right now. Is there anything yeah. you do for your students? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, so often students are working offline and then sort of coming online for aspects of the work. And that aspect can be I just need to download this week's assignment, see what my reading is. I'll do that work and I'll get back on. So I don't really worry about it too much for the um, for the our regular uh, online student. Interestingly, what we've gotten a little bit better at is, and this is through our refugee work, is how to design our materials for downloading when people can work because they don't have electricity or connectivity. So we actually are learning how to do more of that. And now thinking about how do we bring that into communities where access, kind of where we started the conversation, where access may be limited. So it's a really good innovation lessons uh, being learned there as well. So I, for us, generally in our online population, not a real issue. For our youngest generation of learners, they kind of live on screens in a way that you and I probably don't. I'm not sure they're feeling screen fatigue in the same, quite the same way. They're digital natives. Um, what's interesting to me is the shift to mobile. And like I'm sitting in front of this big monitor talking to you and everyone on the call, but they're living on this. 
So we just moved to a new admissions portal. 65% of the applications are now coming in on mobile. Mm. When we work with refugee populations, um, because phones can be had very, very cheaply, they're doing most of their learning on this. And you now have to start really thinking about how you design materials, how you design learning for this environment versus this massive screen real estate that I'm looking at at the moment. Could you talk a little bit about your faculty? Uh, there's a question here about how do you address faculty anxieties or just more generally, how do you train your faculty for this, this radically different model? Yeah, so let me um, point you to uh, AC, the American Council of Education. Um, I happen to be on the board. Um, we gave them all of our faculty training materials that are sort of our internal IP, but we had so many questions around this. We just said, look, we're just going to make it available to the world at large and for free. So if you go to ACE, you'll see a special COVID-19 page. And I think lots of others are doing this. So there's yes. really good materials there. Um, I'll tell you what it's not very much about. It's not very much about the technology. It's right. really about presence, students, thinking about how you do, um, how you engage with students um, in the con weird conversational space that is an online discussion board, um, dealing with the kinds of issues that typically come. You'll see the whole list of those topics there when you look. And the other thing we learned is that you can't just throw all that training at people. So you have to prioritize and think about kind of what's the most important set of moves people will need at the beginning and then give them training more of a just-in-time mode or resource at just-in-times like, Oh God, I just had this thing happen in my class. I didn't handle it very well. I got to be better at this tomorrow. I'm going to go look at and just get the training I need here. So shorter training that tends to be much more topical in that sense. Um, but there's a very rich inventory of those materials for you if, if, for whoever's asking the question. Yes, yes. And we certainly had to develop our own materials and, and, and even sharing it with our colleagues in K through 12. I think this is a a great opportunity to all think about think about our teaching differently. Um, another question and, and linked to something we talked about before, you know, deep learning typically happens in discussion and sharing different perspectives. Um, and you talked earlier about the importance of assessments and dashboards and monitoring. Um, how do you measure whether or not students are achieving deep learning or yet, you know, higher education traditionally has done such a bad job at measuring and assessing actual learning? Yeah, we've gotten really um, passionate about project-based learning, or what some people call authentic learning or authentic assessments, which really ask students to apply what they know in sort of real-world context. Now, our adult students really prize those assessments because they feel more relevant, right? This is, they all often say, the thing I learned yesterday, I'm putting to work today uh, in my workplace. Um, and oftentimes it's the experience of the assessment that gives them the practice and hands-on tools to do that. All those assessments are undergirded by very detailed rubrics. So there's absolute transparency for a student to know what success looks like. And if you think about it, Bridget, and you know this better than I do, um, in the places that matter most to us, we always revert to project-based, um, excuse me, to you know, project-based learning or simulations uh, performance assessments. So um, it's great that you get a 4.0 in Emory-Riddle in flight school, but and it's great that you did really well on your FAA exam. We want you to have a lot of hours in the simulator and then a lot of hours in the right-hand seat before we're going to give you the left-hand seat. And it's great that you did great in your nursing program, but we want to see lots of hours of clinicals, and then we're going to put you under the supervision of an experienced nurse uh, before we let you lose on patients all by yourself. I think there's a version of this that we have to think about but I, I did a sabbatical at the U.S. Department of Education, and I asked, um, I think it was AIR to come in, kind of do a primer for the department on the state of assessment in higher ed. And I've got, this is not exactly their words, they were more gracious, but they said it was something between dismal and awful. Um, and if you look, you know, if you're, if, you know, you have people at Hugsy who are assessment experts, and if you look yes. at most assessment as we see it implemented, it's yeah. pretty dreadful. <laughs> um, so this, if, when I look at that vision, that circle that I gave you, if you said to me, like, you know, everything there is real and happening today, it's not blue sky, but where it's weakest is on the assessment side. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking at the time. We're almost out of time. But Paul, I want to give you um, just a final moment for any last words you'd like to leave us with um, as uh, we all continue navigating this very different uh, time for, for institutions. Well, I think, you know, I was talking to somebody about this recently, an, elder, uh, an elderly person who, you know, recalled for me that there was sort of, you know, for a previous generation, World War II was the pivotal, seminal 
event in which there was everything before and then everything after was different. And you think about afterwards was the GI Bill and what that, how that transformed America. Um, I think about the opportunities I come from an immigrant working class family, like what happened after World War II? I think this is gonna be our pivotal moment as a generation. We've never seen anything like this in our lifetimes. So there's an opportunity here. And I don't know where the good and the bad will be in this, but I suspect that it's in the practices we bring to bear today. Like the seeds of what's possible is happening today. And I think it's easy to get consumed with the immediacy of, oh my God, how do I do this in my class next Monday? But the big questions will be around, you know, how do we now get at these issues of equity? Is there an opportunity to reinvent our systems? Is there a way to redefine the problem? You know, I think it's a rather cliche, I'm sure you've heard it, but you know, Einstein, I think it was asked, you know, I said, if I was given an hour to solve a problem, my life depended, depended on it, I would spend the first 50 minutes getting the problem right. Mm. And right now we're doing a lot of focus on how do I fix this? But the big problem, like how we want to frame these problems is a place where I think Hugsy can, you know, Harvard, Harvard as a sort of number of students served is very small. Harvard in terms of its influence on our industry is enormous. You, you all have the opportunity to help reframe the problems, I think very powerful ways. Um, and that's the right thing to do as we think about what, what a year from now looks like, what two years from now looks like. Right, right. I think it's time for all of us to, to pivot. I mean, we're certainly mourning what we've lost and what we expected to happen is a bit different than what we're actually living. But to pivot and, and really turn to that call, call to action about what should the future look like? Because so many of us and so many of you who hear my voice right now, we're going to help shape what the future of education is going to be. And quite frankly, we've got to worry a lot about not losing a generation who unfortunately are not being served as well as we'd hoped, but quite frankly, weren't being served very well even before the pandemic. So let's use this time um, really to work together and, and to push the frontier um, to, to what education can and should be in so many ways. But that's gonna take uh, not just the technology, but as we've talked about again and again, it's the people, it's the teams um, all up and down from the leader to those who are on the ground level and hopefully students yeah. working together with us. So. Paul, I wanna say thank you again uh, for joining us. Um, thank you audience members for your questions, um, for being actively involved. And again, special thanks uh, to Jody, to Meg and to Team Connect um, for putting this together. Um, uh, we'll post the video very soon and I hope uh, that you can join us for our next speaker. Um, thank you again and have a good afternoon.